So today we're continuing in our mini-series in, uh, in the book of Philippians, just looking at Philippians in chapter 1. And we've come today to the section uh, in chapter 1, verses 12 to 18. And Wes is going to bring us uh, the reading from God's Word this morning, Philippians chapter 1. Hello, today I'll be reading from the book of Philippians, from the ESV, chapters 1 and verses 12 through to verse 18. Verse 12. I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel, so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defence of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. Yes, and I will rejoice. The Apostle Paul was a man who rejoiced in his circumstances. He's a, he's a joyful man. You find that as you read through his letters, how he, he talks about rejoicing and he urges us to have the same spirit. Now, that's not in some unrealistic way, some self-indulgent way, because, of course, we know when Paul wrote this letter to the Philippians that he was in prison. We know that his enemies are working actively against him. We know that the prospect of, of, of death was imminent for him. So they're not the usual circumstances we think of for someone to speak about living joyfully. But he does. And in doing that, he reminds us of a tremendously important thing. And that is that the believer is confident that no matter what happens, that God is always in control, always working all things together for good to those who love him. So Paul's not the sort of person who says, why me? Now, why does this have to happen to me? Often we hear people who have just that attitude, something bad's happened, maybe some great trial or even a tragedy, and they blame God. They say, I could never believe in a God who has allowed such a thing. And yet for however many times we hear that from people, we also hear of those like Paul and countless others who have followed him who have rejoiced in the midst of trial. You think of someone like Johnny Erickson Tata, tragically crippled as a result of a swimming accident when she was a teenager. And yet her books are full of hope and inspiration, have been a great help to people. She rejoices in her Saviour. The Apostle Paul rejoices in his Saviour. The Christian life is a life that is characterised by joy. Now that doesn't mean that that joy won't be at times punctuated by tears. It doesn't mean that severe testings and trials will not come. It doesn't mean even that sorrows, clouds and days of darkness won't come and linger. But always beyond that and shining through that is the glorious prospect of a better day. A better day that's promised and guaranteed by the blood of Christ. And so we know that nothing shall be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ. And if nothing can separate us from the love of God, then we must rejoice. That's the logic of this position. So Paul's conviction is that all things, all things that ha have come to pass in his life, all things serve to advance the gospel. I want you to know, brothers, what's happened to me has really served to advance the gospel, he says. He was convinced that nothing could ever hold up the progress of the gospel in the world. And so he shows us how this progress happens. He shows us the way in which the gospel is advanced, even through the circumstances he's in. And so we'll just follow that through today, uh, just these various ways in which the gospel advanced, because Paul was in prison uh, in Rome, writing to his believers in Philippi and telling them about it. You think about how the gospel advanced for the believers he's writing to, first of all, because he says, I want you to know. I want you to know about what's happened here. This is something that will be beneficial for you to know. They were, of course, friends who supported him, who followed him. They wanted the best for him. They're anxious for him. A number of them certainly seem to be anxious because now he's in prison. How can that be a good thing? How can that help the cause of the gospel? Some were anxious. 
Over in chapter 4 and verse 6, he says, don't be anxious about anything. That's something that is to be uh, a, um, a bedrock for our faith. Don't be anxious about anything. Why were they anxious? Well, maybe some were saying, well, where's the power of the gospel? How is it possible that Paul can be in prison? When, when he came here, first of all, there were miracles. Great miracles took place. A slave girl was set free from the power of Satan. Well, can't God set Paul free from the power of Rome? Prison doors were miraculously thrown open. Well, is the prison in Rome too much of a challenge for God? Because you see, there are people who are attracted to the gospel by its power. Crowds followed Jesus for this reason. They saw the things that he did. They were attracted to him. They followed. They wanted to see the things that Jesus did. And we can be sure that there were those who were attracted to Paul for the same reason. But if it's only the power that attracts them, well, when trouble strikes, such people are floundering. Paul says, don't be anxious. Don't be anxious because what's happened to me, he's saying, is for the advance of the gospel. And what that means, therefore, is that their understanding of the gospel, what the gospel is, how it works, what it's for, their understanding of the gospel was increased as they saw how suffering was not a hindrance to the gospel, but even served its purpose. And Paul showed by his attitude that he was in no way discouraged by what had happened to him. Yes, he may have been planning to take the gospel to Spain at the other end of the Mediterranean. Yes, he may have planned to visit Rome on the way, as he as he'd uh, told uh, his, uh, his um, uh, friends and other places. But now that things have turned out so different, he's still content. In chapter 4 and verse 11, he says to us, I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. And so he writes this letter to the believers in Philippi. And as they take it, read it, they're encouraged. They get this letter from Paul in Rome in prison. And what do they find? Well, Paul's doing just fine, thank you. And so they're encouraged by that. Their anxiety for him is lifted. And then they thought of their own circumstances. And they looked at their own circumstances through different eyes. Well, if Paul in prison can say, I'm doing fine. In fact, this is just working out wonderfully. If Paul can say that, if he can be so upbeat, then why should I be downcast in my circumstances? And so it is that down through the centuries, as the Lord's people have read this letter, they've been encouraged, they've been strengthened to press on in their difficulties, whatever they may be, and in this way the gospel has advanced. So Paul's an encouragement to us in our present circumstances to say, well, this, this is not hindering the cause of the gospel at all. And then Paul talks about himself. Yes, as an advance for the gospel for the believers in Philippi, but for himself. Because, look, Paul views everything in the light of the good news, in the light of the gospel. Now, that's not merely the pious talk of someone who's undergone some wonderful religious experience. These are words of one who truly believes that the gospel is just that, that it is good news, irreversibly good news. Nothing can stop it from being good news. And so he does rejoice in verse 18. Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice, and I will rejoice, he says. So when he exhorts believers later in this letter to rejoice in the Lord always, he's not asking for something that he doesn't mean. He's not asking for something that is not what he himself does. So Paul's not looking for sympathy when he talks about his circumstances. I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. What has happened to me? That's all he says about it. He only tells us enough to inform us of his general circumstances. Now we know from reading the book of Acts about some of the difficulties that he faced in even getting to Rome, how he was shipwrecked and almost drowned, how he spent many years in, in prison. In fact, it's been reckoned he spent more years in prison than out of prison. And we can only imagine the, the discomfort, the inconvenience, and all the hardships that he's now suffering in Rome. But he doesn't dwell on that. He's not looking for sympathy. He's not complaining about his circumstances. You know, you get the impression from some people they're never happy unless they're miserable. They're not poor. You can't make poor miserable. 
You drop him into some of the most trying conditions a human being could ever face, and he says, I rejoice. And when he said that, he was confident that God would finish what God had started in the believers in Philippi, yes, but he also had that same confidence about himself. What God has started in me, he says, I know God will finish. And if that means by way of a Roman prison, well, that's okay. Because that's the plan, the purpose of God. So Paul's showing us here something of the practical benefit of joyful living. You see, it made Paul to be outward looking. He didn't dwell on himself. He didn't need to. You know, when you're dealing with someone who seems to be permanently unhappy, you'll find generally it's because of some wrong or perceived wrongs that they've suffered. But the way to break out of that, of course, is to focus on something outside, is to focus on others outside. And if that can be focusing on being a help to others, well then, the battle's half won. Now that's just good human psychology, isn't it? But there's more to it than that. Paul, in his trials, thinks of and ministers to his friends. You think of Jesus on the night of his betrayal. That night when Judas is going to betray him. He knows it's going to happen. He knows what's going to follow from that. The, 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 the arrest and, and the trial. All that lies ahead leading up to Calvary. On the night of his betrayal, Jesus took his disciples and he taught them deep truths. And he encouraged them. And he comforted them. Surely you would have thought if that was a time, if ever there was a time, for him to be comforted by them. But you see, Jesus being confident that he could commit all things into the hands of his Father, he ministered to his disciples. Well, Paul's got that attitude here. He knows his case is safe in the hands of Jesus, therefore his mind and his heart goes out uh, to his, his friends in other places. He wants to make sure they're not anxious. He wants to make sure they know what's going on. I want you to know this, brothers, he's saying. Remind yourself of this fact. Remind yourself constantly of the fact that your all-wise, loving Heavenly Father has led you on the path you are now on. Does it sometimes seem like a prison? We're using that sort of prison terminology at the moment with the, the conditions we're, we're living in and it's a, a, a little bit loose isn't it to, to fashion ourselves uh, being in our homes not able to get out as, as being somehow akin to prison but perhaps other circumstances of life make you feel like you're in a prison you're, you're trapped in a series of circumstances that just kind of sweep you along well there are deep mysteries in the providence of God and the deep things, the hidden things, must remain with God. But you can trust your way to your God. Be still, my soul. The Lord is on thy side. Remember that. So Paul can say for the believers in Philippi, I want you to see how the gospel is advancing because of my circumstances. But then he says, look, I want you to know what's happening among the Roman guard. Verse 13 of, of, of this chapter says, It has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to the rest, all the rest, that my imprisonment is for Christ. This imperial guard he talks about, well, they were the elite soldiers, the pick of the crop. They were the soldiers who were chosen to guard Caesar's household. Now remember, Paul's writing to the believers in Philippi. Philippi is a Roman colony, is a place that was home to many retired Roman soldiers. Perhaps many times back in Philippi, the believers must have wondered, well, how can these soldiers in Rome, how could they be reached with the gospel? Well, Paul says it's like this. God brings me a fresh batch of soldiers several times each day. They're guarding me. And they're chained to me. And you know what? I tell them the good news. Think about that. You know, it's, it's amazing, isn't it? Here, here's Paul, chained up in prison, soldiers to guard him. Paul tells them the good news about Jesus. Now, from Paul's perspective, of course, it's hard work, tiring work, always giving out this way. From the soldier's perspective, being able to talk with the apostle, I suppose, must have taken away from the boredom of their job. Paul told them the good news. What Paul can say is that no one is left with any doubt as to why he was there. What are you doing in Rome? Everybody knew why he was there. What did he tell them? Well, he doesn't tell us here explicitly what he told them, but we can guess fairly accurately from 
Other speeches that Paul has made that are recorded, other things he wrote and talked about, we can guess fairly accurately what he would have told these soldiers. Instead of asked him, what are you in for? Nice to go home and tell the family you're guarding a notorious criminal today. Let me tell you about this, this new prison that came in today. So he tells them, what are you in for? Well, it's because I go around telling people about Jesus Christ. How does he do that? Well, think of this. He's, he's dealing with these elite soldiers. He's dealing with the imperial guard. And so he'd tell them of some of their fellow soldiers, other Roman soldiers, centurions, captains in the Roman army who met with Jesus. He would tell them of one whose servant was healed. And they want to know, well, who is this one who has such power? He would tell them of the centurion who was there watching Jesus die and the profound effect that that had upon this man. No, they would want to know why the centurion would say that this one, dying as a criminal, Jesus dying as a criminal, why would the centurion say he was a righteous man? And so Paul would tell of Jesus. He'd tell of Jesus' mighty works. He'd tell of his wonderful words. He'd tell of his compassion. He'd tell of his promise of eternal life, for everyone to come and believe in him. He'd tell of his death and his resurrection. He would tell of those whose lives had been transformed by the power of Christ. And he'd surely use examples from Philippi. He'd say, let me tell you about some people in Philippi. I went and told this good news to him. Look what happened to them. And in other places as well, he'd talk about everyone he'd met with whose lives had been transformed by this powerful gospel. So, Jesus, uh, so Paul would speak about these things to the, to the soldiers. And not only the direct conversations that he had with them, they'd see how he conducted himself. They'd see his courage. They'd see his conviction. They'd see how he talked with friends who came to visit him. How he responded to his judges when they came with these charges against him. They heard the letters that Paul wrote as he dictated them to his secretary. They heard these words before anyone else. Isn't that wonderful? Here's Roman soldiers sitting there and Paul's dictating this letter. And the first people to hear it are these soldiers who were guarding him. And all of this had a profound effect upon them. Word spread quickly. This is a remarkable prisoner. There's something different here. And soon Paul and his case, and especially his gospel, became the talk of Rome. So the whole imperial guard and all the rest knew that my imprisonment is for Christ. And many came to believe. When Paul signs off this letter at the end, he says uh, in verse 22, all the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. Especially those of Caesar's household. There are some here who have come to faith. You can imagine some of the soldiers sitting there uh, with Paul and saying, make sure you send our greetings to the people in Philippi. Make sure they know that we've come to faith as well. Many came to believe. So what is your place of service? You know, what, what can you do in the cause of the gospel where you are right now? Right, because right here, right now, is the place that God has assigned for each of us to work. This situation for Paul wasn't a hitch in the plan of God for the advancement of the gospel. It wasn't a hibernation or a lockdown or a disruption or any other terms, fancy terms that we're using for our current circumstances. What happened to Paul was for the advancement of the gospel. It actually caused the gospel to advance in ways you never would have imagined. Because we don't, we don't know. But it doesn't take too much imagination for us to consider what an impact these converted Roman soldiers, the palace guard, what they would have had uh, it, what impact it would have had as they went on other assignments throughout the empire. In fact, this may well have been one of the most instrumental means in taking the gospel to the far-flung corners of the Roman Empire. There's never anything insignificant in the providence of God. So it certainly caused the advance of the gospel amongst the imperial guard, but then for the believers in Rome as well. Verse 14, he says, Most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. What an impact Paul's uh, brave, courageous evangelism had on the congregation in Rome. News spread of the conversion of a large number of soldiers, how that must have strengthened the believers living in Rome. And those who came to visit him would report back to the congregation how he's going. He's going just fine. And so they too would be galvanised for action. There's a wonderful 
power in example, isn't there? And, and the Lord's people being an example to others. That's why it's good to read missionary newsletters. It's good to read of what's going on in other places. It's good to read biographies as well, what's happened amongst the Lord's people in other times. It's good to be encouraged and reminded by the example of brothers and sisters in the Lord. So Paul can say most of the brothers have been more bold to speak the word. As to say, it was a broad movement. It wasn't consigned just to special workers, to preachers. Suddenly Rome was alive in a way it had never been alive before. And what did they do? They preached Christ. They preached the word. Some indeed preached Christ, verse 15, he says, verse 17, they proclaimed Christ, verse 18, Christ is proclaimed. That is to say, they went where the people were and they told them the good news. They said, listen, here's something you need to know. And what was it? Well, it was nothing vague, nothing indifferent. They preached Christ. They told the good news, the sorts of things that Paul would have told to the soldiers. Same things are repeated. Who Jesus was, what he did, what he said, what he has accomplished, why you need to come to him, how there is new life in him. They preached Christ. The gospel advanced that way. And yes, amazingly, Paul can even say that the gospel advanced through his enemies. He says, some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry. Out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. There were those, you know, who were always critical of Paul, of his methods, of his approach. And they'd be saying, well, there you are. Paul got it wrong, so he's ended up in prison. We're not like that. And so they used that opportunity to draw a distinction and to draw people away after themselves. And Paul says, you know what? What does it matter? It doesn't matter what their motives are. He's not condoning false teaching, but he's saying their motive doesn't matter. If what they are saying is the truth, if they're telling objective truth about who Jesus is, what he has done, what he offers, how to have new life in him, if that's what they're saying, then that's a good thing. Always a good thing. Don't worry about what their attitude to me is. If they are presenting the truth about the Lord Jesus Christ, well, I'll rejoice in that. These were people, brothers indeed in the, in the faith, but they didn't see eye to eye with Paul on the matter of his methods. And they were seeking to put Paul down in their preaching. Paul says, don't let that upset you. Is the truth being proclaimed? Yes, it is. Well, then I rejoice. And so the gospel advanced. Of course it advanced. It always advances. In the most unlikely of circumstances, it advanced. You take the leader of this Christian outreach movement, you lock him up in prison, and watch the movement take off. That's what happened. It's what's happened throughout the history of the church as well, as there have been these oppressive attempts to hold down the cause of the gospel. And guess what? It explodes. What's happened in China over the past 100 years, especially in the last 50, 60 years or so, that's what happens. All this has served to advance the gospel. So keep looking outwards, keep looking upwards, don't fret for your circumstances, indeed rejoice because of them, because God knows best. And may we be encouraged with that assurance, with that conviction, and may it embolden us to uh, tell out uh, to tell out the good news that we have come to know and, and love and embrace as well. Let's pray. Now, Father, we thank you for your so great mercy to us in the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that he came from heaven to seek and to save that which was lost. We thank you that this was your plan and your purpose from eternity. We thank you that that plan is being worked out. Nothing will be able to prevent that from happening. We thank you, Father, therefore, that uh, even the worst uh, efforts of the enemies of God cannot hold that back. Even the stumbling efforts of your people cannot hold that back because there is a sure and certain purpose. Indeed, he who has begun a good work in us will bring it to completion. We, we thank you, Father, for truth to speak into a world that is uh, full of contradictions, full of lies, full of false hopes. We thank you, Father, that in the gospel there is a hope that is an everlasting hope. We bless you for your mercies to us. We thank you for the fellowship that the people of God have one with another. We thank you, Lord, that uh, even though we are separated uh, physically, yet there is that blessed tie that binds the hearts of your people. 
in Christian love. May we be encouraged in that. Bless us as we go into this coming week. Lord, use us. Make us to be, we pray, helpful uh, to people that we meet with. Give us uh, a, uh, a ready ear to listen, uh, to hearts to feel, Lord, voices to speak, uh, words of hope and encouragement. And Lord, yeah, give us, we pray, the joy of knowing that we are in the purposes of God and therefore all will be well. We ask it through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.